Welcome to the Bootstrap Founder. Today I'm talking to Danny Postma, one of the most prolific and publicly active indie hackers in our entrepreneurial community. I talked to Danny about running a business with a global customer base, how to deal with copycats and clones, and why SEO plays such a big role in building a successful indie business. Danny shares his thoughts about outgrowing the solopreneurial life or being at that point, what being a digital nomad means for the stability of your personal and professional life, and how he deals with being a pretty big deal on Twitter. Danny is an amazingly humble and insightful person. You'll have a blast learning all about him and his journey. And before we dive into our chat, a quick thank you to our sponsor, Acquire.com. More on that later. Here's Danny. Thanks for being on the show, Danny. Now, we're recording this with a 12-hour time difference here, and you're in the Kuala Lumpur time zone, if I'm correctly, and I'm in Eastern Canada. That's like directly on the other side of the world. And I think a majority of your customers probably are located in North America too, right? Or somewhere in, in this time zone here. So yep. has this quite substantial time difference affected how you build your businesses or your products and how you engage with customers? How, how does that work for you? Mm. I think it makes me more productive because most of the time when all my customers are sleeping, I, I'm awake, right? It's like, uh, I think it's 9 p.m. at your place now and it's 9, yeah, 9 a.m. So. at my location. Yeah. So I get to, especially because all my friends are in Europe, I get to work until 3 p.m. without anyone messaging me, WhatsApping me, blah, blah, blah. Social media is super quiet. So I get quite a lot of uh, productivity. The downside to it is that if something happens, most of the times it's at night. I get a lot of messages, partners I work with, they message me at night. So the nights are a little bit less calm than I like. But it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a payback. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you, you just shifted around, right? You shifted by by half a day. So, do you yep. do anything about this? Because I, I certainly remember having a lot of customer service stuff, you know, happen at random times during the day. But if if all of this happens in the middle of the night, how do you deal with I don't know outages or customer service messages with like high priority? What do you do? Do you just so, wait? So when I launched when I launched Headshot Pro, like for the first few weeks, for the first week, I think all the servers went offline while I was sleeping. So my subconsciousness would wake me up all the time at night checking the servers and then at 3 a.m the server will be down but i think it's now robust enough that it's out of skills customer support can wait to be honest like my wife does the customer support when she wakes up in the morning and then we just basically ignore it for 16 hours until the next morning because i have i i have one mantra i don't build tools and software that really rely on me always being there that need to be offline like like email tools or anything like this i don't want to i don't want to build it like a lot of respect for anyone who does those things like i want to make tools where i could be gone for the week and if i do ignore customer support it's not that much of a biggie so yeah it's uh, it doesn't limit me the, at all to be honest Okay, so it's so it's about not building critical tools, but being tools that are so good that people treat them just the same way when it comes to budget. You know, because most yeah. of the time we we say like critical things are the things that people have budget for, but you've mm -hmm. built like successful businesses from apparently non-critical things. So how did you do that? Like, how did you instead of criticality focus on something else? What is that other thing that makes your business is so interesting to people. Mm, I think what I'm focusing more on now is before I used to make software, right? Like Headline, which was a copywriter, a corporate generator. Um, I think I'm more going into the B2C, B2B one-off payments. Like it's not a software anymore. It's just a one-time purchase, like the, the headshot gen AI headshot generation. Um, you purchase it once, you upload it, and you get your product back, right? So it's like a one-off product. We've automated the complete refunds, customer support, and everything. So when I went on holiday with my wife to Holland for two weeks, I just turned on the auto refund. So anyone that had an issue, they could request a refund. So we just all get automatically done. I, I, I just love to make robots. Like I, I want to completely automate anything. Um, yeah, that's that's the mantra. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I guess, do you still consider yourself like a solopreneur at this point? I mean, you, you say your wife is involved, but that, that is, yeah. from a technical perspective, are you still the only person doing this, at least? So she she helps two, three hours a day. Um, I'm still a solopreneur, but I'm actually, I posted my first job post yesterday to looking for a machine learning engineer. <laughs> I saw that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm making a rough... I, I'm. 
there's two reasons that led me to get there is number one is I'm pretty sure I have ADD. So it's six months into Headshot Pro now and I'm like mentally unable to build any more features because I've been there, I've done it. <laughs> and I'm so like, it doesn't, it doesn't like stimulate me to work on those features anymore. And then my brain just doesn't want to do it anymore. So I haven't built anything for three weeks. That brings me back to getting anxiety because I know there's a lot of competitors coming that way. So it makes me really stressed. And I'm like Headshot Mail Pro makes a lot of revenue right now. So I was like, yeah, it's quite dumb if I don't use that to build maybe like a little asynchronically team that's remote, find some like senior people that can help me out, focus on what I'm not good at. So yeah, you might see me moving from a solopreneur to more of a small team support this way. I'm trying to like figure out how that's going to look like because I don't want to build a team. Um in the sense that I don't want, you have a lot of companies that have this company culture. You're always online chatting with each other and stuff like that. Like that's not how I get work done. So I wanted, I would love to have a team that they can self manage themselves. You give them um, some bigger task and they come back in a week with the solution. And you have like maybe some chats via Discord or whatever. So that's, I still want to keep that solo founder mantra inside of it, even though I tried to build a team. I guess the easiest way would just be to hire somebody on the other side of the planet. So there's no chance that you ever get to chat, right? It's probably yeah, like so, a little so trick. That, but that's an issue because I, I tried it out once with a friend of mine. He's in Europe. And then he would wake up at, he would start the day at 10 a.m., which means it would be 5 p.m. for me. It doesn't work because I'm, I'm tired. I've worked nine hours. I don't, I don't want to just dive into work anymore. And then if he has questions, for example, it would be like 8 p.m., so your complete downtime where you are supposed to rest as an entrepreneur, like it's gone. So I'm really trying to hire for Asia now. Like America would be impossible for me. Europe is already kind of a no good, to be honest. So I'd like to keep everything in the same time zone. So, so you want it to be in the same time zone, but you still want it to be remote. Am I getting this right? Yep, correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw not not only the tweet with your uh, hire that you that you're looking into, but I also saw this tweet about you trying to shadow a remote team to learn how to manage it, which is a really really cool idea. Can you can you expand on this? Like, why you're doing this and what you think you're gonna get from that? And also, has anybody allowed you to join their teams just yet? Yep. So I learned from doing right. That, that's that's the way I'm right. doing. But good luck learning how to build a team, a process, task manager. <laughs> Because yeah. I, I haven't worked in a team. I worked in the team as a freelancer, but it's like a different thing. So I don't, I don't know how the process is of a remote team. So I could try to figure it out myself, which like, I don't know where to start. So I was like, hey, maybe some crazy person is going to allow me to just be a fly in the wall, sit in the Discord in the task manager, see how that team goes. And I actually got a lot of replies, like uh, Sahil from Gumroad added me to his notion and his Slack yesterday. Nice. So I've been taking notes all day how they work. And it's so interesting. Awesome. So based on that, I've actually put some processes. I'm being like seeing how I'm going to put in my notion, how the task manager is going to be. So I've learned a lot, of, a lot from it. Like I think more people should try to do things like this, like just shadow someone. Yeah, it's interesting. It's cool that people allow me. And tomorrow I might be joining someone else. I just need to sign an NDA because it's a lot of like... Um, it's a sensitive information, right? That you get access to. So yeah, been learning a lot. It's 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 dope. It's really cool. I'm 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 really surprised in, in in a really good way that this actually works. You know, like that somebody is actually letting you see their internal stuff. I, I think this kind of culture that people allow others to see the internal stuff of their business is effectively building in public, like through you as a proxy. Right? That's kind of what this yeah. is. That's so cool. This, this, I, I feel would have never happened like 20 years ago. Like nobody would have allowed yeah, I, like a random stranger from the internet in their business communication, right? Well, I think this is the, cause I never, I've never met them in real life, right? But because I'm building in public, I think already for the last five years, like people see my personality, they get to trust me, I guess. Like they see what my, what my, yeah, how I'm working. Cause how, how did you, for your company that you sold a few years ago, how did you know to scale it? Did you work in a team before <laughs> or? Just trial and error. Well, here's the thing. We didn't scale it pers personnel-wise. I was afraid to hire. I'm probably at the point 
I'm, I'm probably a month behind where you are right now because I would have had to force myself to do it, but I didn't. I just thought, ah, I can deal with this. You know how it is, right? We, we built something yep. and then you, you spend a lot of time and you wish you would have had more time, but it's not enough to hire somebody for because it's just a, you know, a couple hours for the project or whatever. And I had that all the time. Like we had five and a half thousand recurring customers. Like that was not just one of payments. That was SaaS subscriptions. Um, most of which we automated away. I am like you, a big fan of automation and we had a lot of automation. That was pre AI times pretty much. It was like mm-hmm. at least before like. any kind of GPT existed and in intercom, we were using that at the time for our uh, customer service stuff. They already had AI tooling. I don't know. They had some machine learning in the background, I guess that looked through your knowledge base and then suggested like word matching kind of substitution matching. I don't know what they did, but they, they brought the articles that were the best potential articles mm. right into the first reply. So people most of the time found the, the things that we had written and, and solved their own issues, but it, it got complicated. And I think most, the, the biggest reason that I had burnout at the end of Feedback Panda when we mm-hmm. sold it was this reason. I did not know how to hire, which is why I'm so impressed by you actually doing this, like going out and, and saying, and I think it's an identity thing too. And I, I was going to ask you because that's kind of why I asked, are you still a solopreneur? Because the moment you choose to build a team, you're not a solopreneur anymore, right? It's, it's a, it's a different mindset. Like, I, I wonder, what are your goals now that you're building an actual business? Like, not just a business in a, in a, in a formal sense, but like a, a team of people building something together. Did that shift the goals that you had for whatever you're doing? First of all, I'm completely winging it and I have no clue what I'm doing. It scares, <laughs> yeah. it scares me right. so much. I bet. And I've got, I've I've tried to do so. I sold Headline three years back, two years back, three, yeah, two years back, because I had three options. I could get VC funding and do hyperscaling. I was talking with Andreessen Horowitz, Sequoia, blah, blah, blah. I could have bootstrapped it and built a team, or I could have sold it because I had two uh, people interested in buying it. And I was like, I don't want a team. I'm scared. I don't know how to do it. And now, two and a half years later, I'm running into the same position with Headshot Pro, where, yeah. I cannot do it alone anymore. The only option would be either to sell it again or to build a team. And I've been starting to realize like, yeah, look, I'm 29. I'm going to run into this issue a lot of times in my life again. Right. I'm financially yeah. stable now. If I, if I ruin it revenue wise and whatever, like I do have the backup. Like this is the moment where i could learn to do it and if i fuck up and if i don't like it i'm i'm trying to set standards with anyone i'm interviewing i'm telling them like this is my first time i don't know how it's gonna go if you're gonna quit your job for it don't you're not the good and this is why i'm trying to start like as a with contracts like maybe like part-time people that already have another client like try to start it in like more of a safety area in that sense um yeah i need to and yeah, it's also an identity, right? Because I built my whole solopreneur stuff around it on Twitter. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I think <laughs> I think it's time to it's time to stop doing it by myself because I'm gonna I'm gonna run into another burnout. Like, right. it's simple as that. Oh yeah, like it's that not possible. Was- if you keep going like this and have nobody to help you, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a little trouble, and it becomes a a lot of little troubles, and then they just add up. I'm the thing that that I find so interesting is um, that there are two ways here, right? You could you could either do the, the same thing over again. You could sell it, build another one. Sell it, build another one, right? That's that's kind of how platforms like acquire or, or all these other things. It just exist for this. You get it to mm-hmm. a certain point. That's the point where you kind of Peter principle, where you stop being good at, right? Where mm-hmm. instead of kind of hiring yourself into the next biggest position where you don't have the skills, you stay where you are and kind of sell the thing. But you chose to go beyond that. That is cool. But it also means a lot of change for you, right? Because now you're a manager. Congratulations. <laughs> it's it's going to be very different from indie hacker. Indie manager. Maybe that's going to be a, a new thing. I, I'm just, I'm just excited for you to, to take this step because not only is this something that uh, I would personally be very afraid of to do myself, mm-hmm. but I know that you're a person that shares a lot of your journey on Twitter and in the building public community. So everybody's going to benefit from this. And this is really cool. Mm-hmm. So thanks for taking this step. This is awesome. And doing it in public at the same time. That's really cool. I'm, I'm happy. Some other people get some, uh, something out of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm, I'm planning to go share it. Like I'll, I'll, I'll be public about it. I'll share how it's going to go. Um, 
yeah, that's how, how I learned. I can scroll back later, a year back in Twitter, see what I learned, what went well and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to see. I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous. <laughs> I bet. And I think that's okay. I guess like, you know, entrepreneurship every day is a, another mystery, another challenge that we have no clue how to deal with. And we try to, you know, grasp at straws and try to figure out how things work. That's just what it is. What I'm happy about in particular is that you're honest with the people that you're hiring, that this is an experiment, right? That's really cool. I mean, that just shows what, what kind of um, business perspective you have. You're going to try it out. You're going to learn to get better, right? Yeah. And I think this is the issue. Like if, if, I, I I have the mindset that I like to ship products really fast and kill them really fast if they don't work out. But if you're going to ship a team really fast and kill that, you cannot because people, their families are like, it's a whole different mindset. Yeah. You cannot do it because people depend on it. Their salary, like emotions are involved with it instead of like just a bunch of code. So like, yeah, yeah. yeah this is what right. I think that's the, the most scary part. Like I can try it out, but it's going to hurt people if it doesn't work out. So yeah, being upfront about it, contractor only. Yeah. Well, th that's that's a good point because like if I look at your your website, the the postcrafts.com with all your projects that you have, which are I don't know what, 16, 17, almost 20 projects that you've done in the past. Like the, the moment you you go full on one project, that kind of precludes you from building other things, right? Because that, that re responsibility you just mentioned, now, now all of a sudden you have to pay these people and their families, maybe their mortgage depends on you keeping running yeah. uh, this, this project. That, that, is a, that is a big step to take. I, I don't want to scare you any further. I'm just trying to say, like for an indie <laughs> hacker, this is a, a pretty, pretty sizable move to make. And um, I don't see many people make this move uh, because they get scared. And you, and you are scared, but you're still doing it, which is really nice. I, I quite appreciate yeah. that. That's Thank awesome. you so much. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's cool to see this happening. I think the this being a, a lesson and a learning experience at the same time because you learn it and you teach it as you go. That's just something that that is such a such a indie hacker community thing, right? Like, where would we mm -hmm. be without people like you who are sharing their experiences here? We would never even try. So. That's mm. really cool. Um, but on the other side, um, and we talked about a lot of your, uh, building public stuff that, that you've been doing and you've been sharing a lot over the, the last years, just how you built these businesses, the ideas you had and how, how they came to be. What I wanted to talk to you about this kind of the, uh, the reason why I, I contacted you in the first place. There was a, a day where there was this, this copycat thing happening on Twitter. And that was kind of when I reached out to you. I don't know if you remember this, but you probably do because yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a pretty yeah. weird day. Right, somebody just c cloned your full product completely, like down to the copy, and then posted some weird, like kind of rage bait tweet about and telling you not to be mad at them. Right? Can you can you give me? Okay, do you want to talk about this, or does this feel traumatic to you? <laughs> like, no, I, I would I'm, love to I'm, go I'm, back I'm to the day. Just I developed a thick screen over it, so uh, we can uh, we can definitely dive <laughs> in. It was so odd, such an odd thing. Yeah. Yeah, wasn't wasn't that weird? How did that feel to you? Because I remember you you kind of engaged with it, and then at some point you just deleted all your tweets that you, you did to this to this person. So what happened there, and and how do you deal with these things? Because that's probably a fear that many indie hackers have that somebody just clones the whole thing and then tells them not to worry, right? Yeah. So so with headline. Uh back two years this happened a lot like people carbon copying like if, so there's a difference between copycats and inspiration right like inspiration is you you yeah. you i don't care if people take the same product idea as me because i also get inspired by other people like it's fine but once you take someone's whole landing page copy branding colors and everything and all their like everything is the same that's a copycat so let's just, just stay like set that down because a lot of people argue with me because it's a bad thing because people are gonna think they are your you they like the competitor is you, so people are gonna get confused. That's that's like the biggest issue. So with headline for like two months, I was just busy fighting them, being negative on Twitter about everyone copying me, and people got so fed up with me, like telling me like shut up, stop being so negative, and like it really got me down at that time, two years ago, but that fueled me to actually build the version two of Headline that got acquired eventually, because I was like, fuck, my product is so easy. Everyone's copying it. I need to, I, 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 I think I need to take three months and just build it into a bigger thing. So I'm ahead of the curve again. 
So it happened so many times. And now two years later, like it happens a lot. Um, I don't care that much about it because 99% of them, they don't go anywhere. Um, this one just rage baited me so badly by just like yeah. calling it out that he copied me on purpose, making a tweet about it. It was 10 right. p.m. I was about to go to sleep. So I was already so tired. Mm-hmm. I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you got to you gotta find this tweet. And like, no, he deleted it, right? I think he deleted it. Like he just rage baited me. And I, I sent it to Peter. And Peter Levels was like, dude, you're just feeding the trolls. He's going to get engaged and the clicks out of it. Delete it. I was like, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't spend time on this. Uh, I DM'd him. I was like, dude, there's something called DMCA, which is the, the Millennial Copyright Act. I can mail Cloudflare right now and they're going to take you down tomorrow. Like, you better just turn it into something else. So he actually listened. He changed the copy. So it's still the same product, which is 100% fine. Like, that's competition. But now he has his own landing page with his own images and his own copy. So, yeah. You, 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 you go... You you grow a thick skin after a while. It's just yeah. It, yeah, it stays annoying. This is why um, I'm blocking everyone. Everyone that's competing with me, I block them on Twitter. I just don't want to see what they're doing. Right. It's like as a mindset for myself, I don't want to see what they're doing. Um, I actually unblocked the founder of Copy.ai two weeks ago after blocking him for two and a half years, just because I, I don't want to see what Copy AI was doing. Um, keeps you sane, to be honest. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good mix of don't feed the trolls and also kind of protect your yourself from just th- their stuff, right? The, the the influence that they might have. And I guess by blocking them, I mean, if you block somebody, all they need is a second account, and they can still read your tweets. But at least on <laughs> yeah. their main account, they're not gonna see your stuff, right? Which is yeah. algorithmically probably interesting because it's not gonna get pulled in that much into their feeds either. So you don't see them, they don't see you. Everybody is at peace, <laughs> so that's great. Yeah, and yeah. A, a very interesting. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% behind you on this. D- just don't feed the trolls thing. I also did not reply to this or retweet it because I did not want our community mm-hmm. to either like, brew up a shitstorm because I, I don't want negativity like this either. It's bad enough they copied you. They don't need to have their mm-hmm. lives ruined by a couple, you know, a couple thousand nerds. Like you don't need the nerd brigade to, to come in and yep. destroy their lives. And I also any any like any retweet is kind of validation for them, right? That was the rage bait. The rage bait part. Let's see what we can do with this, right? That was the well, whole especially idea. If you, Such- if you have eighty thousand followers, it will pop up in a lot of people to feed. Oh, yeah. Uh, Twitter uh, promotes rage bait and engagement, people yeah. commenting. So our, I think already in 15 minutes, it got 10, 20, 30,000 views. I was like, yeah, it's just not a good thing. What I don't yeah. understand, like just, just slipping into this, like the whole building public is like five years ago, I couldn't dream I'm interacting with you, other people, Sahil founder of uh, Gumroad and any other like big guys on Twitter. Like building public is... Mm-hmm. The best thing about it is that you get to meet people you've been inspired by your whole life. You learn from them. And by making a carbon copycat of someone else's product, you just destroy your name <laughs> in any That's chance. And then <laughs> I'm going to fed up already. But they're building in public. <laughs> they're building in public. Yeah. So their whole purpose of it is to go there, I guess. And you destroyed yeah. it by just doing one thing because no one is going to trust you yeah, anymore. That's right. Because they see you that's as a right. team. That, that like, exactly, want to hang out with that, that is dumb. It's right. so dumb. Yeah. It is, it is really destructive. I agree with you. And I, I if, if we look at this, like from a less emotional level, it really is a highly destructive behavior because the only thing you have when you're building in public yep. or when you're in the indie hacker community is your reputation as a good yep. community member. So by doing anything that destroys that reputation, you burn any potential future opportunity. Like the, those people, I, I th- I'm, I'm not sure if I even followed them or if I blocked them out of spite just at the same mm-hmm. moment, right? As, as it happened to you, I was like, I don't want to interact with people who do this kind of stuff to Danny. I like Danny. I don't want Danny to suffer. I'm not going to talk to them ever again, which I mean, I mean, it's probably fine with them, <laughs> but, but yep. it's, it's still in this community where reputation is everything. Like these acts are really short sighted. That's the, that's the thing, yep. right? It's super short sighted to just copy and hope to make a couple sales, but, and then mm-hmm. not turn it into something better. Just like try to stay a copy of something. It's, mm-hmm. it's really, really like a short term win that turns out to be a long term loss. It's unfortunate. Yep. 
But that's yeah, yeah. well, that's what it is. Um, I I do wonder now that you are very active in the the visual AI space. If I look at your postcrafts.com, I'm just gonna drop your domain a couple times here because it's really cool to see your projects. If I look at like the top seven or eight, eight, nine, ten projects, they're all AI based, and. Yeah. Most of them are like visual AI, right? You have hairstyle yeah. AI, you have Photoshop, you have Headshot Pro and Deep Agency. All of these are really about, you know, f- physical visuals of, of people. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Mean Morph is gone, but you know, this model does not exist and profile picture AI. All of this is AI. How much competition do you have there? And I'm, I'm not just saying indie hacker, stupid clone mm-hmm. competition. I mean, like actual meaningful competition from, I mean, Peter, always competitor of yours. I know that, but you know, the, 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 the much bigger pockets, like how much com- competition do you have within this field right now? I think there's, so if you focus on Headshot Pro, I think there's five big competitors. Um, mm-hmm. I see in my AdWords. Uh, one VC funded company who actually stole also all my landing page and tries to steal my marketing agency <laughs> and all the things, which oh, I yeah. think is very odd for a VC agency. So I think there's five competitors in that sense. Provo Picture, when it came out, had like hundreds of competitors. Lensa, obviously everyone mm-hmm. knows Lensa, I think was the biggest competitor. Oh, yeah. Um, I love it when I get a VC backed, highly popular competitor because then they do marketing for me and I earn, earn the money. Like, Last week, Remini is going viral, which now does AI headshots on iOS. And my sales have been tripled since that day because nice. everyone is Googling for AI headshots and I'm ranking number one on AI headshots. So I just get all that traffic and I convert them. So perfect. Awesome. Um, the hairstyle has like a one competitor, I think. No one is doing hairstyles yet. That's the one I acquired. Um, yeah, not that much, but most, all, all of these products are basically pivots of each other. Stock AI, or Tattoos AI turned into Stock AI, Stock AI turned into Provo Picture, Provo Picture turned into Headshots. That's why I have so many products in them. Um, it's just like an evolution of them and I just keep them online. Yeah, so. That's really cool. That's that's a smart move. I, I guess like the, the underlying like models might be different, but everything, the Chrome, the UI, everything you put on top of it probably is, is uh, very similar. So you're reusing your own templates. That's that's an interesting move. Um, uh, n- not a surprising one because obviously you're kind of niching down into every single field. H- how did you how did you pick this? Honestly, like AI, visual AI, th- there are, is a lot of stuff going on. There was a lot of NFT things going on in the past. How did you go into like headshots and professional headshots too, like mm-hmm. the whole agency thing, the stock thing? So, so it started this. So generative AI came out in September 2022, I think, when Stable Diffusion launched. And I just decided, yeah, the obvious the obvious point you can do is make a stock photo website. Um, so I built Stock AI. But the quality wasn't there. People weren't willing to pay for it. I was deadly scared that I would get a cease and desist from Getty Images or whatever because they have so many big yeah. lawyers. I was like, I'm not going to sit in this one. So then I worked on... Yeah, then I think on Twitter, I saw DreamWoof launching. So Austria.ai, they made a... Yeah, they made a... You could turn your face into styles. And Peter sent me a DM on Telegram. He's like, dude, check this thing. Uh, and he was building something. I was like, you're fucking kidding me. I'm also building it. So we basically just <laughs> shipped it in 30 hours. He shipped without a backend yep. and database because he knew I was going <laughs> to ship faster than him. So he launched on Friday night. I was like, fuck. So I launched on <laughs> Saturday morning. Absolutely exploded on Twitter. I think I got like six figures in sales in a week. Because it's such a shareable, such a shareable uh, product, right? And it, it was super new at the time. Um, I was lucky to rank on Provo Picture, and there's a lot of searches on Provo Picture, like lots and lots of lots. But then Lensa came out. I got like a boost of revenue, and then it started to go really, really down. Like these days, it's barely any revenue. And I was pivoting. So I was working with Davin, a friend of mine, a developer, and we split up. I was going to do Deep Agency, which was basically photo.ai. Uh, as an editor, David was going to use the model I built in Python. Like I made a special pose where you can use photos of someone and you could like get the pose out of it. So you could make headshot with it. You could do anything with it. So that was building the headshot direction. Both launched them at the same time and headshot, like Deep Agency got a lot of press coverage, but no sales and headshot pro got a lot of sales. So that's when I decided to deep down on, yeah, on the headshot 
headshot part. So it's really just an evolution of trying things out. And I didn't expect headshots to have so much, yeah, so much uh, demand for it. So yes, pivoting, 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 trying it out in that sense. That's that's a really smart move. I, I like that. I'm also surprised that uh, the stock thing got press coverage but no sales. Um, you would think that uh, something like this being being covered would be uh, some some kind of lead generator. But was it just a novelty that made the press interested in that? What do you think? So the so there was a deep agency that one that was the. Um... The one where I tweeted out, these models are fake. You can hire in them. And yeah. everyone went mental, like, models are going to be replaced. The fashion industry is going to be destroyed. <laughs> this is the worst thing. People are going to lose their jobs. Um, Your fault. <laughs> yeah, it's all my fault. Um, <laughs> yeah, the editor, like, everyone wanted to use a model and put their fashion products on top of it. Right, but that's so hard to build, and I'm not. I'm not like I've I've managed to build my own deep learning stuff, but I wasn't able to put a fashion at the same time. Headshot Pro was easy to do, so I was like, I'm gonna just gonna deep down on that. There's gonna be some other bigger company who has their claws in the fashion industry. They're gonna do that. So I was like, yeah, okay, it's super popular product. It doesn't make sense for me to chase. So I'm just gonna put it down there and focus on another one. Maybe one day we're gonna go back there again. Um, yeah, and press and clicks doesn't pay the bills. So if you have a product that earns more revenue and has a higher conversion rate, I think Deep Agency had a conversion rate of 0.3% and Headshot Pro had a conversion rate of 10 times that. So then, like, you know, your product is 10 yeah, times better. It. So focus on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I guess particularly for an indie hacker that needs to make money to pay the bills that using the product or just serving the images incurs, right? Because nothing is free on the backend side. That, that is a, an absolutely smart move. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, one thing I, I do wonder, particularly because you already said, like with profile picture, that kind of doesn't have sales anymore. And Headshot Pro is now in a different vertical, I guess. But it's... Do you also think that that will end one day? Like it, you, you seem to be very like focused on experimenting and going where the money goes. Do you mm -hmm. have a kind of time horizon for any project, or do you think this one is going to stick around a bit longer? I think this one is going to stick around longer because you're competing with like Pro Pictures is a vanity, right? Yeah, you, it, mm -hmm. it was a fun thing um, for WhatsApp and stuff, but headshots people actually need the headshots for their CV for their LinkedIn, for right. their teams, whatever. Currently, you have to pay $300 if you want to get a photo shoot. Um, if you can get that done for $39 and it almost looks the same, uh, and 9 out of 10 people, it looks really good, uh, then, yeah, you're competing with a more expensive physical product that suddenly that people can only do in one city with a limited amount of photographers and suddenly you can just build a robot that can do it worldwide um yeah i i think this is a massive market i know there is five to ten billion market size for portrait photography worldwide mm -hmm. so if i can just take one percent of that i'm happy <laughs> so yeah, this is this is a bigger market like i i yeah i see i see this getting bigger um, and that's why I also want to build a team to grow it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, in, and it's, it's an interesting. Yeah. It's a really interesting industry, but yeah, it can always go to shit. Like a bigger competitor comes in or whatever. Um, a lot of people say, yeah, you have to build a sustainable business. You need to take revenue over time. I'm more of like, just get as much revenue up front because your company, especially with AI, it's like, it goes so fast. Like, you could be obsolete next year. And I'll just move up to another product and then have a team to ship even faster to move to the other product, try out different things. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not that scared about that, to be honest. That's an interesting point though. Like the the I, I just I just understood that the team you're building is not a headshot pro team. It's a kind of the the Denny Postma team, <laughs> you know. Well, it's a whole like company, the, the right? Postcraft. Like they, they can, yeah. yeah, they can work on 16 products. I just want to try out new products and whatever has product market fit, then have a team skill that one out. Because I love to iterate. I like to mess around. I hate managing and scaling things. So if I can just have a team that likes to do those things, then I have the feeling it's going to be a monster. Um, you could have a lot of products using the same technology That's in really different cool. markets. Yeah. yeah. 
This is it's kind of the studio model, right? You have a you have a reliable mm-hmm. template of of tech a tech stack, and you have people who know what to do, how to execute, how to you know deal, spin up a customer service platform or whatever. That is really cool. Oh, I'm excited. So what I hear from you is that you're still experimenting with things in the space, right? You're, you're finding things that work. You go into them, you monetize them as much as possible upfront, which is also new. I you know it brings me back to my whole solopreneur question from earlier because you know back a, a couple of years ago, five years ago, if you would have asked me what is a good business. Business, I would have told you m- recurring revenue every month, uh, solopreneur, live your lifestyle business, blah, 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 blah. I would have like, counted down a mm-hmm. couple things. But if you ask me now, it's like, well, you yeah. want to monetize as quickly as possible. Recurring revenue is great, but it's not required. And if you would need to build a team, then you need to build a team. So there seems to be a change that, that happened in my life. Does, did that happen for you too? Did you just like let go of these preconceived notions? So I always thought B2C is, you, you should never go into B2C. B2C is horrible. Don't go into <laughs> B2C, just, yeah. which is still horrible. Like a lot of disputes, angry customers, blah, blah, blah. I'm glad. Yeah, I, I want to replace my wife eventually because she also gets to, uh, to shit with the uh, customer support. Mm-hmm. But what I've realized is the difference between B2B and B2C, like it's really nice to have recurring revenue, but you need to you need to keep building features. You need to have a relationship with your customer. If you're more in B2C, like my skills are, I'm really good in conversion optimization. I know how to build a high converting landing page. And you only have to get them once to buy. There's no recurring thing. You don't have to add features because they don't pay monthly. They just buy what they want. It needs to be good at that moment. And you basically don't have to support them after because they will not come back. They just come for the one product. So you don't have that much of a support load. You don't have that much of a help desk. Um, you can more scale it with SEO and ads. So it's like this whole different, I really like it, to be honest. Like, I really like to optimize traffic coming in, converting them, giving them what they want, and then it's done. Like, that's where the relationship ends. Um, that's what's cool about B2C. Yeah, that, that definitely is. Is that something you looked into when you were like purchasing businesses? Because you recently uh, went a bit on an acquisition spree, I guess, and bought a couple yeah. things, right? And and is is that something you actively look for, like a B two C product that has like p- pay once, use once, and then be gone forever kind of customers? So I saw uh, Nick Nick at Hairstyle AI, and uh, he's also in Bali, and I. I saw him listing it on acquisition.com. And so I sat down with him. I asked for his conversion rate. And his conversion rate was really low. But he got a lot of visitors from SEO. So I was like, this is going to be completely an experiment. Like, I know how to make a landing page convert five to 10 times better. If I can make the landing page convert five to times better, I earn by accurate. Like, if you say, okay, an acquisition price is four times revenue, right? Yearly revenue, four times profit. If I can optimize the landing page to have five times more conversions, I earn back the acquisition price in 10 months. If I do it 10 times, it's five months. And I already had the better AI generation. So I just copied Headshot Pro, put it on his domain name. I think conversion rate is up six times now. So I earn it back in nine months. So it was a no-brainer for me to do in that sense. And then the other acquisitions are, I bought ProvoPictureMaker.com, which is like a 12-year-old domain. And then that one, like people want to make a profile picture. So someone that wants a profile picture probably also might want a new headshot. So I put a big banner on it to link back to Headshot Pro. So I'm trying to like have like all these acquisition channels to funnel back to the main product. It's more like as an engineering as marketing, I guess, like making tools, getting traffic, sending them to the main server. It's it's interesting to see like how you're using like this, the same kind of technology in so many different ways. That's really cool. Also, how how different those domains really are. And domains is something that I want to talk to you about because you were talking about domain leasing a couple uh, weeks ago, I guess. At this point, like that was something that I've personally never heard of before. So I'm uh, very grateful that you introduced me to the idea too. of yeah, just yeah. yeah. right uh, getting a domain for a short time. Can can you tell me more about that experiment? Like what you did there with that. So I wanted to have stockai.com because I thought it was a pretty dope domain. But the owner wanted thirty to twenty-five thousand dollars for it. If you don't have like product market fit, you're not gonna pay 30k for a domain name. But then so then.com has the option you can pay it in 12 installments, 24 installments, or maximum 60 installments, which means they take a higher commission fee, so I think I paid 20% commission over that extra. 
So I only had to pay $500 a month, which is still a lot, right? But if it's a good domain, it's worth it. So I had to pay $500 for the domain. If you don't want it anymore, you can cancel it. And if you cancel it before you've paid it off, the owner of the domain gets the domain name back. You can stop paying for it. So I paid three months of domain transfer. So I paid $1,500. I didn't get product market fit. So I, I just said, I'm going to quit paying for the domain name. Um, so you can like lease it. Wait, well, yeah, lease to own, I guess is the name for it. That's really cool. It's such a, it's such a, so you can try out, because I believe domain names is you need to pick a good domain name because that's how you're going to rank an SEO. Like Headshot Pro basically tells Google that you should rank number one for Headshot, Headshot Pro, professional Headshot, because it's in your name. Like Google gives like a little bit of a boost to it because it's in your domain name. So if you want to make AI stock photos, like better get the domain stock AI. So it's worth paying the money for it, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did you get Headshot Pro? Uh, did, did you have to buy that? Like, did you have to yeah, buy it from three, a $3, domain order? <laughs> okay. $3,000. So. Well, that is surprisingly yeah. good <laughs> for, for a domain. Yeah, I think I uh, so, the, the most money I ever spent on a domain was probably for zero to sold. Like I spent a thousand dollars on on that for my book. That was really zero to sold dot com, which was nice. Yeah, like that is a that is a solid name, and I'm I'm glad I got it. But I've I've never spent more than that, and it, it kind of frightens me. Like the the expense that a good domain name can incur on a business, which is why yeah. this whole lease to own thing is a really interesting one. Like Dan is. But imagine Dan imagine if you if you already picked the name for your book zero zero yeah, and then you get the dot co domain or dot io name like. <laughs> With a headline, yep. I had so many people typing in Google, headline com, headline co, yeah. headline yeah. EO. Like they couldn't find my website because I had the do- IO domain name. Like imagine how much. And I think Damon from Testimonial uh, made a tweet about it. He bought the dot com and all the domain, put an affiliate URL on it. And he basically, I think he paid ten dollars or $20,000 for it. And he earned it back by people just going to the website. So imagine having your competitor buying the domain. You're gonna lose all your customers. Like it's worth it's crazy. if you can spare it to buy the domain. That's good, to be honest. The dot com. Yeah, you you seem to have a lot of insight into SEO, which is something that I don't really know much about. But you've been mentioning several times how well your things rank. Like, how much work mm-hmm. do you put into SEO for your products? I only build products where there's SEO. So, um. I don't know that much about SEO, just to be honest. Like, uh, I just know mm-hmm. kind of how it works. Like, for every product, I do research. So this is for how Headshot Pro c- came out. Like, I was Googling. Like, I, I was trying to rank for profile picture, and I saw there was a lot of search. Like, you can go to hrs.com slash keyword finder. You can type in a keyword, and it will show you how many searches there are for a website. So I saw there's a lot of search for headshots. And that the keyword difficulty, which means the higher the number, the harder it is to go rank in Google. So the moment you have like a keyword difficulty that's under 10 or 20, you're guaranteed to go to the front page if you have like a one or two backlinks. So I only pick product ideas that have a lot of search and a lot of keyword difficulty. Why? I hate marketing. Like I, I hate marketing. Now I'm getting a little bit better in it. I think it's really like if you're an indie hacker, the easiest thing you can do is pick a product that has a lot of searches with no competition. You never have to do marketing because you're going to rank number one on Google. Everyone goes through Google. Like you have, you don't have to do marketing for it because people search for it already. So that's how all the ideas on post, postcraft.com, they're all based on me searching on HREFs for some keywords and then building a product off it. Okay. That, that, that's the money quote right here. That, that, yeah, <laughs> that's <is> cool. <laughs> well, I was I was wondering, would you ever build something where those numbers would not add up for you, where the difficulty would be way way too low? Wouldn't wouldn't do that? No, no, no. Wow. Even if you had a marketing team, you yeah, <laughs> you. <laughs> if no one searches in it for Google, it means you have to create the market, right? Right. So, yeah. as an indie hacker, you're not you're not going to create the market. Yeah, you can, mm. but it's going to be super hard. So if you can just find something people search for and no one is building for it, or maybe like one or two people building for it, you could go number three. 
Mm-hmm. If you're not good in SEO, you could even say, okay, if it has a high enough acquisition price, you could do AdWords for it. Because if people search for it, you can also bid on it. Um, yeah, you're going to have an easy okay. time. You know people want to buy it. And you know you can just not do marketing for it because your website will rank for it. Yeah. This is why I try to tell everyone on Twitter, just go SEO as indie hacker. I might be biased though, but. But you are because you're successful with it. I mean, it's just, I think that's a good reason to be biased if if it puts money into your pocket, right? They yeah. m- must work in some way. And I, I think I, I personally very much neglected it in in most of my projects in the past, mm-hmm. the, the the softer projects at least, because I thought uh, I'll find ways <laughs> to market it, and probably yeah. do. But it's it's still the other way around. Kind of what you're doing is a demand first. Business idea generation. That's what you're doing. It's yeah. kind of what, what Justin Jackson always talks about too, right? Like the, the presence of demand is a good sign, good validation strategy for an indie hacker. Cause if yeah. people are already buying something like this or searching for something like this, it's likely that they will also have budget for yours. And yeah. it's not just you, can, you have a cool idea and everybody needs to buy it. Yeah. And you can basically calculate if you say, okay, my, my, uh, let's say the landing page conversion rate is 1%. Like you can calculate what your monthly revenue could be if you're listed on number one. So you can see, hey, is it worth it for me? Can I do it at that price? Um, Mm -hmm. Like it makes so much more certainty in your decisions. Yeah. Because how did you do marketing for when you started out? If you don't do SEO, like you you, you went probably into social media parts, right? So in in my SaaS business, it was all word of mouth. It was all people just recommending it in the community because we had a very strong interconnected community, online teachers, like teachers love to help other people and they love to help other teachers teach better. So it was a cool tool for teachers. So they gave it to others. But for my own kind of media business, my media empire that I'm building, it's also all community social media stuff, right? That's, yeah, (laughs) it's really what it is. I'm, I'm building good reputations with with people like you to, to come on my show and chat with me. I have people that sponsor this show, like acquire.com does for this one. Mm-hmm. Right. And I have good relationships to Andrew Gazdecki and he was on the show. Like it's all, all relationship based for me. So it's, it's a very community centric and building public, you know, yep. it's all about people in the end. It doesn't really so, matter what you're building. You, it doesn't matter. You already have the followers on Twitter, right? But I've seen so many indie hackers starting out uh, who think building in public is going to bring them the customers. It could but it's going to be such a smaller chance. It only, most of the times it only works. Like it worked for me. I, I had 200 followers and I grew to 15 K because I was sharing a new technology that was novel and people love to follow you for it. But if you're building a product that's not n- like new, refreshing, people want to see how you build it. It might be really hard to start out with bowling in public. So better just focus on like a guaranteed marketing channel like that. Yeah. Yeah. But building in public is wonderful. If that you have two audiences with building in public, really, right? You have your other founder peers, the people around you, the other indie hackers. And if you build a product for them, wonderful. You've solved all your problems. Mm-hmm. But if your audience, your actual customer audience is somewhere else, then building in public will not attract them unless you build right there for them in a way that appeals to them. Right? That helps them, that gets them somewhere, either as a content marketing, whatever strategy, or you have a podcast in this space and you get other experts in and they invite their own audiences and whatever. But building in public is a thing that it's, it has to be intersectional to meet both. And other, if it doesn't, if, if the only audience that you talk to about your product is other indie hackers, you still get something out of it, right? You still get good advice and that kind of stuff, but you're not going to sell. You still have to get people to actually look at your product and pay for it. Yeah, that's right. So w- with with that in mind, um, <laughs> I, I do wonder sometimes because you're now at eighty thousand followers too, right? Like you you have a sizable Twitter uh, Twitter it's audience. I mean, well, we're probably yeah, we're never gonna reach Peter because he's gonna just keep keep moving away from us in terms of followers. But it's still it's still bizarre that between the two of us, it's kind of two hundred thousand people or something. <laughs> it's like what yeah. is this? Well, Peter, it's just I, 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 I have think. to thank Peter. I think most of my followers came through Peter because he kept retweeting me. Yeah. Same with John Young Fruk from Ben and Bear. Like I've yeah, been right. my Twitter account is built on giants, man. Like they've been sharing it so oh, much. 100%. And especially the whole healthy competition with me and Peter. Like yeah. I I went from fifteen to now it's 87,000 in like a span of a few yeah. months. It, it's so bizarre. Yeah, it's and, so and that, that's like built on, on the shoulders of giants. That describes my whole life at this point, right? Like the, every, everybody who ever talked about their business on a podcast like 10 years ago, 
I got to use what they taught me and I got to build something yep. cool. And now I get to share my story. It's same for you. Like we, yep. if uh, not, not admitting that the giants and they're still walking, right? They're, they're still walking mm-hmm. and sharing these people that we, we consider giants. They're still in the community. It's crazy. And, and, and that's the thing. Like it puts a lot of attention on them and on them and on you and on me. Like we get a lot of exposure to in, in front mm-hmm. of a lot of people. Do you sometimes wish you wouldn't have that much attention? On Twitter, I, I, I was talking earlier about the, the copycat thing and the, mm-hmm. the shit storms that sometimes happen. Do you sometimes wish you could just be an anonymous founder somewhere? No, no, because it brings me so much. I, there's so yeah. many upsides <laughs> to it that like the yeah. downsides that it has. So yeah, there's only a few reasons why I would not want to do it. I'm quite twitter addicted so not having anything would Mm -hmm. probably remove that from it away like have more of a calm calm life that's i think that's literally the only negative thing copycat it's like you got you you get to learn with it like you're gonna get competition yeah but i you get so much back for it like it's so worth it get to talk like i basically have my whole board of directors on twitter like i i post about edwards people help me out like where how where do you get that i get to learn from other people so much like the only reason i can do this alone is because i can other ask other people for their feedback to help me out um yeah and you need to start early to do it like I, you need to start years and years ago it's not going to be suddenly there um yeah it's 100 percent worth it no i would not um i don't think yeah i don't know if i want to go to the level of peter where he gets recognized and everything everywhere like it's i think what yeah. we are lucky with though is like we're like a bit more he's more known in like a little niche so he's not like real life famous so i guess he like it he gets recognized in co-working space and stuff like that so that's that's a nice part but i would never want to be like a famous famous yeah yeah bigger yeah have you have you heard the uh the 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 article i think tim ferris wrote that one yeah yeah i talked a lot about it to be famous Man, that is a, such a scary piece. I, I never want to have to change my name at the airport as not to be abducted. I, I don't want that. He went, he went regular people famous, right? Yeah. And then he, right. like what he said in his article, one out of 10,000 people is insane. Um, yeah. If you have, how many followers does he have? Like, let's say 2 million, which means he yeah, has like at least 200, 20 to 200 yeah. crazy people following. Yeah. Never. Yeah. And you have nine. Or something, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You have eight point seven. <laughs> Just yeah. do the math on that. <laughs> it's it's already there. That's that's the thing. Like it's it's in our community, and I guess there might be a shift between the the psychological profiles between different communities. But you know, if if you then have an edgy opinion and you you uh, attract a lot of you know negativity or a lot of criticism, yeah, I I wouldn't want to travel in in that kind of world. I think yeah, because I already had it with the deep agency tweet. Yeah, the yeah. deep agency tweet that went viral. Thirty million people. I got so many death threats in my inbox, dude. I was like, wow, that's crazy. What the fuck? Like, you don't want to go viral, viral. So I'm I like 80,000 is nothing on Twitter. I'm like sitting nicely and quiet. I get to interact with cool people on Twitter. I think it's <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. It's good. That that is that is good really level. nice in our community. And hey, that that's that level of just being connected with people just makes so many things possible. Like I I remember I only had like 400 followers when we sold our business back in the day, mm. but it was already just meeting the right people and having having good connections, mm-hmm. just following the right people and interacting with them. Mm-hmm. That was all we needed to do. I think that's that's kind of among other uh ways that's how people found us to even acquire us. And that may be my, my last question here in, in this wonderful conversation. It's really nice that you're on. Um, now that you're building a bigger team and you're, you're still, mm-hmm. you're building the studio of, of all of that and experimenting more. Do you still have the, you know, the, the dream exit kind of somewhere in, in your future? Do you still consider this as a goal or do you just want to keep doing what you're doing until you just drop dead from, you know, old age? So before I tried, before I made the decision to, build the team right i i was already thinking like i'm gonna sell headshot pro and yeah chill around but it was like i already did it with headline i'm just gonna build another product again so i'm just gonna be in this visceral loop of i'm gonna hit where i don't want to scale i have to sell it headshot pro doesn't have any strategic acquirers which means you're gonna get like a 3x multiple for it instead of like an 8 to 10x it's not worth it man you can automate it wait for three years get your money out so if I can have a team that supports it, 
So yeah, it, it, like it, for me at that price, it didn't make sense. So I was like, okay, yeah, then then I need to go that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what are you gonna do with the money anyway? I'm probably gonna put it in houses right. and investments. I tried sitting on the beach, maybe depressed. I need to build, like, yeah. So if I if I can build a team that's still async, then that's good. Yeah. Do you, no, do you still con- uh, do you consider yourself nomadic? Do you still consider yourself like a digital nomad at this point? No, I've been stuck for four years in the same spot, so I don't think I'm that nomadic <laughs> anymore in that sense. <laughs> Nothing but, wrong with that, right? Like you, you can make a choice to yeah. stay in a cool place. But it's annoying. Like it always has in your mind if you live in another place. Like my family's in Europe. I live in Indonesia. Like I never feel that that this is the place I'm gonna live forever. So you always have like this nomadic lifestyle. Oh, I'm gonna move somewhere else. Maybe I want to be close to my parents. So you don't never have the rest in your mind. Like this is where I'm gonna build my life. So that's always gonna yeah. So that's why I'm like I'm a little nomadic. I might move to Portugal one day or to Kuala Lumpur. I'm I'm not like fixed to this spot. Okay. Well, that's that's interesting too. It, it's it, it, you, you're absolutely right. I think I move every what five or ten years in my life. I've always yeah. always moved around too. It's it's not nomadic because I I settle in that location for a while. But mm-hmm. you know, a couple of years ago I was in Berlin, and the time before that I was in San Francisco or in my hometown, and now I'm in in Canada. That's a, a kind of nice. you know sectional nomadic life that I do. I just settle everywhere. I find a house and I live yeah. in it for a while. So do, do you um, have it that after a, after a few few years you get bored and annoyed like so bored of a place you're like fuck i need to just throw it all around and need to move to another spot is that is that why you move or is there another reason to move around uh, no for, for us or for myself it was always like the, the circumstances of, of my life partners mm-hmm. or jobs stuff like that that's mm-hmm. that's kind of that where my nomadicism came from my boredom is mostly with with uh yeah also just like with you with the business like i, I don't want stagnant things to do and i can find things in a place to do because we're all digitally connected. So there's a lot of distraction if I want to. I just need to look at Twitter. I, like you, am highly addicted to Twitter. <laughs> That's obviously the same thing. <laughs> like so I spent bad. way too much time there. But the opportunities that come from that, they they spiced up the life that I have. So that's yep. that's the reason why I also would nav- never want to give it up. So, so I'm a uh, reason that you have for, for trying to, you know, build an audience and be uh, a presence in the community. It's just because so much is coming back. And yeah. that is enough reason for me, at least right now, to not care where I am, because it doesn't matter where I am, the thing I'm going to be doing, it's the same anyway. I've got to hang out on Twitter, and I'm going to do things, right? Maybe warm <laughs> outside, maybe cold, I don't care. So that's yeah. that's it for me. Um, nice. Yeah. How's, how's life in Indonesia? That's, that's, uh, that's it feels like a place. I've never been there. How, how is mm-hmm. that for, for a founder? How's the founder life there? I I think a large part of how successful I am now is contributed that to that kind of life. So in Europe and America, I, don't, I cannot talk for America, but for Europe, it's very normal. You do everything yourself, right? Cooking, cleaning, groceries, this, that, 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 that. Uh, community work. So let's say you already, and this, this might be a highly opinionated, but he, and I will go, but I will explain why it's not in that sense. Like you spend like four hours, I think in Europe, just like, supporting your life in that sense here in asia i wake up i order my food gets delivered to my house um house gets cleaned i have a gardener in that sense so you the things you don't want to do you can outsource to someone else a lot of people are going to say yeah that's bad you hire someone else but in this like everyone gets a part of the country and this is how everyone lives in indonesia like my wife for example they also order food like as locals because why does it happen you suddenly have three people who have a job as a cook because uh, there's no so there's no social security here, right? So everyone needs to have a job. Everyone, like the whole economy, I think gets like stimulated in that sense. And this is very Asian, like it's more as an Asian thing, like you outsource in that sense, right? Um, I yeah, Mark Mark uh, got cancelled once on Twitter for saying these things. So I think <laughs> yeah, like, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was fun, but I know it's but it's so but it's so normal here. Like everyone, everyone does it. It's like the way in Asia, different than Europe. And Europe, I think Peter called it Calvinistic. Everything needs to be done by yourself. And in Asia, they believe more. It's like everyone gets a part in the community to do whatever they're good in. Like I'd rather cook a fucking nasi goreng from someone that loves to cook that makes a good meal than me making a garbage nasi goreng. 
<laughs> that's that's right. how everyone thinks. That's 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 how everyone works in this. Like that's how it works over here. So I get to say four hours a day, I think, um, in that sense. So oh, I can focus more on my company uh, instead of having to cook, which I don't like, having to drive to work, which I don't like. Like it makes life a little bit easier in that sense. Um and it's also like, yeah, I think the sun helps a lot getting to walk outside. Um yeah. good weather. <laughs> yeah, not so much here in Canada, can tell you that. Like there is some sun, oh, but, but not I, much of it. And I do miss that though. I miss like hiking outside. I would love to go to Canada. I don't know where you are, British Columbia, maybe uh, Vancouver, We're where in Ontario. are you? Ontario? Yeah, Ontario. Also yeah, beautiful. Toronto the, my, the area. If you, if you ever come over, feel free to stop by. I've actually been four times there. My my family lives there. Yeah, I like it. Oh, nice. It's such a nice area. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's a beautiful place. I I like it too. Obviously, um it's like space having space is wonderful because I can just sit outside and look look beyond, right? And just think. That's really cool. I used to live in big cities and cities are great too and you have a lot to do, but there's something about being like close to nature for somebody like us who works in technology, right? Where, where it kind of gives you this this sense of there are bigger things than the latest version of JavaScript or whatever. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's kind of mm-hmm. nice. That is very it's cool. Fu- it's funny uh, how every, for every area, every area has their own thing. Like in Asia, here in Bali, it's harder to go out because it's really busy with the cars, so we don't go out that much yeah. that far away. I went back to Europe. Right. We got a car. We drove around road trips. So that's I'm really missing those kind of things. So everything has an upside. Everything has a downside. Right. My wife is Indonesia, and I have a dog here. So yeah, I'm living life here right yeah. now. Maybe we move back to Europe. Maybe we go somewhere else. Well, we'll see. We'll see where life brings us. <laughs> I'm not stuck. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. We, we have a dog here too. Uh, Bina is like a year and a half old, and and that is already a reason for me not to move anywhere else because she likes it here. This is her house. The dog owns this house, right? Like this is her place. Yeah. I don't want to go anywhere. Yeah, but also trying to move and fly with a dog like it's not going to happen. Like, yeah. It makes yeah, like you're gonna right. have to settle down with it. It's it's bizarre that it's so much easier to to fly with a child or a, a group of children than it is with a dog, right? But this this I guess it's travel problems. I yeah. I guess these are just things that come with with these choices that we make. I'm glad yeah. you've been making the choices that you made, and also for talking about them uh, here with me today. Let's uh, tie this up with a bow. If people want to follow your journey. And see what you're building and see just how your cool idea of hiring people comes along. Where do you want them to go? Where do you want them to follow you? Follow me on Twitter, <laughs> Danny Postma, double A at the end. is where I share all my journeys, everything I do. I don't share revenue anymore, sorry. Uh, but all the other learnings are there on Twitter. And if you need a new headshot, go to headshotpro.com. Ah, good pitch. I like it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Danny, for being on the show and sharing all that stuff with me today. That was Thank a wonderful you so much for having Thank me. you so much. It's good meeting you, real. Absolutely. And that's it for today. Now, Danny mentioned earlier that he had acquired a business at some point that was extremely well aligned with his existing portfolio from another indie hacker. Really, that's how it happened. And that's Danny's perspective here. But this also means that somewhere out there, there is now a founder, an indie hacker, just like us, I guess, who is significantly more wealthy after having sold their app to Danny. And that's what Acquire.com, the sponsor of this episode, can do for you. Imagine this. You're a founder who's built a solid SaaS product. It works. You have customers. You acquired them over a long period of time, and it's generating consistent monthly recurring revenue. People are interested in your product. And the problem now is that you're not growing for whatever reason. There may be a lack of focus or a lack of skill, a lack of plain interest or something. I don't know. You just feel stuck. What should you do? Well, the story that you would like to hear is that you would buckle down and somehow reignited the fire. And that's that's what it is. You get past yourself and the cliches and you start working on the business instead of just in the business. You build this audience you always wanted to build and you move out of your comfort zone, do sales and marketing, and half a year later, you tripled your revenue. Well, reality is not that simple. That's just wishful thinking. Situations may be different for every single founder who's at that particular point in time. But too many times, the story ends up being one of inaction and stagnation until the business becomes less valuable or even worse, worthless. If you find yourself there or your story is likely headed down a similar road, I can offer you a third option here, and that's consider selling your business on acquire.com. Capitalizing on the value of your time is a smart move. Don't waste it. Acquire.com is free to list. They've helped hundreds of founders already. So go to try.acquire.com slash Arvid and see for yourself if this is the right option for you at this point in time. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Bootstrap Founder today. You can find me on Twitter at Avidkal, A-R-V-I-D-K-A-H-L, and you'll find my books and my Twitter course there too. If you want to support me and this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Really appreciate that. Get the podcast in a podcast player of choice and leave, leave a rating and a review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. That's the best way you can help me and the show. Any of this will really help the show. Just a good rating, a good review, best you can do. We'd really appreciate it. So thank you so much for listening today. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.